which code editor should you use and why is it VS Code? Just kidding. There's four different categories of code editors and we're not just going to talk about that in this video. I also have a special guest who's a founder of a code editor that you probably know. He's going to give some must know tips as well as advice for people trying to have success in the tech industry, both as a new programmer and as a tech founder. So there's going to be a little something for everyone in this video. And if I give you some value, I hope you'll subscribe. Now let's get started. We can look at the Stack Overflow developer survey and see that VS Code is by far the most popular. And that's for a good reason. It runs fast, starts fast. Uh, there is an extensions marketplace that you can add language support, linting, formatting. You can add GitHub Copilot really easily. So does that make it the best? Well, if you're a beginner and you're doing web dev, probably yes, because most of the stuff you're doing your debugging, your console, your network tab, that's all directly in the browser. So if you're using Chrome, it's developer tools. So you don't really need that much in your code editor. But when you get into writing things like Java, Go, using things like Unity, or developing apps for iOS or Android, or let's say writing embedded code on something like an Arduino microcontroller or a Raspberry Pi. In that case, you're gonna get into more specialized editors. These are called IDEs, and they're often language specific or even more specific. So like if you're writing Swift code for iPhone apps, you're definitely using Xcode. And this is actually a completely different experience because the IDE, first, it takes a lot of RAM. <laughs> so you can actually justify buying that more expensive MacBook. And if you've ever written code in something like Unity, it doesn't even feel like coding. So much of it is done for you through autocompletes and it integrates with the Unity software. So you can, you know, do something in Unity and then it will pour it back over to your library. You can create a class and then that'll appear in Unity. And then you get really great things like a debugger that just works out of the box with Goland, for example. You can step through each line really easily and you can approach problems more intelligently than just trial and error. Next, you have the terminal-based code editors, which is an interesting category because many people are almost religious around using Vim, using Emacs. And there is a real reason you have to use them over just opinion. And that's really if you're writing code remotely on a server. So take something like AWS. You have a computer running. You don't have a graphical interface for it. So yes, you can create a virtual machine, blah, blah, blah. But you can also edit files remotely without any of that by just using Vim. It's either pre-installed on your instance or you can quickly install it. So for this reason, it's good to at least know the basic Vim key bindings because if you don't know, you can't really do anything <laughs> without knowing these special um, bindings. Best example is the arrow keys. They're not the arrow keys. They are the middle row of the keyboard. J of K L, I think. <laughs> I, I do use NeoVim, so I should know that um, as my primary editor. So you have this use case, you know, remote server code, but then you also can really, and some people don't know this, you can really configure Vim, specifically NeoVim, to be just as powerful as VS Code. So all the syntax highlighting, the formatting, the autocomplete, even GitHub Copilot, and you basically do all this through configuration files. And I do really think, although people disagree with me, you do become faster at your workflow by using Vim. So because the inputs have this larger lexicon, you can do more in less keystrokes. But to be fair, it could just be sunk costs that I have spent so much time with my configuration that I um, am delusional. So just putting that out there too. Final category before we speak with our guest here is browser-based code editors. So you got Jupyter Notebook, CodePen, Code Sandbox. I'm sure you've seen these and they're really great for just Googling something you need to do and copying code as well as learning because you have, for example, an environment with HTML. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's all pre-configured. And then you can just write code in the browser and share it and get feedback on it. So there's actually a lot of reasons to use these. And let's actually bring Chris in right now because he'll explain it better than I can and stick around because he's got really good tips for coders at every level because he's been in this game a long time. He's had a ton of success in the tech industry more than me. <laughs> yeah, he's just a really smart guy. So let's go over to Chris. Chris, thanks for joining. Could you just introduce yourself? Who are you? What are your main things you're working on? And specifically, what is CodePen? Yeah, right on. My name is Chris Coyer. Thanks so much for having me, Aaron. I work on an app called CodePen, which is kind of like a code editor in the browser. And you can, you know, sign up for free and make stuff and share stuff and stuff. I'm sure we'll get all get into that. So pretty cool. I have a podcast myself, too. It's uh, uh, not on YouTube, but it's called uh, Shop Talk Show that I do with my friend Dave Rupert. 
we launched CodePen to the public in 2012, and it's 2023. So I guess it's 11 years old, which is kind of a middle-aged project, I guess. I guess you know, like that's maybe even edging on old. The thing that you make on CodePen is called a pen, and you just go to that page, and there's three panels: HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And you write in those languages, and you can kind of choose from different preprocessor languages too. For example, SAS turns into CSS, so if you'd like to write in SAS, you can. And then it's showing you in real time the changes that you're making. And it, it can be really good for people learning code. For example, you could type an h1 tag, hello world, and then select the h1 tag in CSS and write h1 color red, for example. And right below that, it changes the color to red. So you didn't have to download and install any software to do that, but you're writing real HTML and real CSS and it's kind of seeing what happens. So it does kind of, I wouldn't say it's a tool that's just for beginners, but it's very beginner friendly in that it's just on the web and very easy easy to use and free. People use CodePen for learning. Not that students is our number one use case. I think it's more used by professional web developers who just need to make a prototype for something. I even might use that pen then and send it to my coworkers in Slack or Discord or whatever so we can talk about it. It can become kind of a talking point during a meeting or something like that. Then you have it. It's like this reference implementation of a you know, piece of front end code that you can use and look back on and iterate on and fork and things like that. It also can be used for, for debugging too. Like I'm having trouble with this. So I'm going to recreate it over here in this minimal environment and see if I can whittle it down. You know, sometimes called a reduced test case in programming. That's nice to have. So troubleshooting, prototyping, educational reasons, showing off and stuff is a good reason. A lot of people use CodePen because we have social network stuff on there. Like you can comment on stuff and heart stuff and follow people. There's those dynamics involved too. So there's some incentive to like put really cool stuff on there, like just very beautiful layouts or animations or things like that. And then, you know, you get your dopamine blast or whatever when it becomes popular. Uh, I know some things I've used CodePen personally for are if you want to do something, like you said, specific in CSS, like just get a really cool button. You can just Google for like amazing button code pen. And then right on Google, you'll get like a bunch of pens, like okay. direct links. And then, like you said, you can either fork it or take the code and like modify it um, to your specific use case. And then another really cool specific one that a lot of front end developers might want to use is like, I got a CSS confetti animation. I used to work at Uber. So when I worked on like a career software and when someone like finished all their um, tasks for an interview, we do like the confetti effect and yeah, it's, it's right like on. falling down. Yeah. So yeah, it's a great way, as you said, to find animations, CSS that's maybe a bit more custom, but doesn't come in a library. Yeah, you can find, I, I won't say almost anything by searching for what you need plus code pen and Google, but a lot of stuff when it comes to particularly like stuff. CSS and then like custom JavaScript things. So yeah, I've, I've used it a right. ton. Inspiration is huge. I mean, I should almost mention that one up front is that looking around at code pen for an example, like a confetti animation, you probably won't find one. You'll probably find a hundred. It's all open source. Everything that you find that's public on code CodePen is MIT licensed, meaning you can just grab it and use in your project. So yeah, inspiration is a big one. And that was always very compelling to me to see that it's not just like a picture of some confetti or a tutorial that might walk through how to do it, but who knows how old it is or if that code even still works. You know it works because it's working right there in front of you. you know? I think a lot of people here, they're also kind of interested in, you know, starting a business or yeah, things related to tech startups. Okay. So, like this is actually like pretty cool technology. You guys have a huge scale with how many people, you know, use it and so on. So how has, you know, since starting everything uh, been going, like how's growth and in general, you know, how is the company? Yeah, pretty, pretty okay. I, uh, I should say it now at this point, used to have a blog called CSS Tricks that I also ran for over 10 years. That was the original inception of it. Like, let's make the demos over here and then put them on CSS Tricks which was kind of cool for launch is that I already, a ton of people wanted to use it already just because of the following I had built there. Like, But then, you know, it's still got to be a good product and we just worked really hard on it for for all those years, eventually going full-time uh, on the app, which is great. So th the 
the way that it, it works as a business is that there's pro plans for it. So, you know, go pro on CodePen. That's my job to, to convince you to do that. That's the absolute bulk of, of how our business works. And there's just little stuff that you get, like being able to make a pen private so nobody else can see it. A little bit like you can make private repos on GitHub. If you want to make a pen, but you're doing it for a client or you just don't care that anybody else looks at this thing that you're doing, to, in order to make things private on CodePen, you have to have a pro plan and that costs a few bucks a month. Mm -hmm. So that's our, that's the kind of main driver of it. That's exciting. So it, it, it sounds like you're still kind of like scaling it. You're you're going all in. So like, what are the current goals? For, put it. Yeah. So what, what, what are the goals for the future? Just grow, grow it as much as possible. Keep adding features, users. Do you have like a vision for the next few years? A very clear vision, I'd say. Yeah. Because there's a there's mm -hmm. a, still a ton of usage of it. It's a good brand. And we have like a thing that's like, I think you could do more with this app. It, it's capable of more than it's doing now. So that's kind of where we're at in our like business trajectory is let's let's do it. Let's take a shot, you know. Awesome. Yeah, awesome uh energy. Yeah, so uh what what have been some of like the specific biggest challenges if you don't mind sharing and then also like breakthroughs you know, on the project? Oh yeah, God, really. A, a, a good question and there's been lots of them. You know, one of them that we look back on as kind of a a mistake, but we would just like add features right and left. And so if we got ourselves into a position where the editor had a bunch of interesting features on it that were pretty costly to maintain and pretty bug prone to the point where our bug log was pretty thick to the point where like man this is it and at the same time we had this vision for what we're doing now which is working on this bigger more capable version of code pen while kind of keeping it solved but we'd never make any progress on it because we were constantly like fighting things that were on fire and uh, would come up and i think that was kind of a mistake in that we were just too too fast and loose with the product early early on that we paid for it later, but it really cost us time and slowed down innovation. We did take awesome. funding at, at, at one point. It's not a, it's not a company that's like just massive VC driven thing, but in the, you know, after a few years of CodePen existing, we had like kind of a friends and family round and then we're like, okay, let's try that because it gave us some money and then we immediately used the money to hire, which is pretty common mm -hmm. in businesses. And we used those people to build out uh, a new product too. Not a mistake. Uh, but what we, what we use it to be able is just kind of like add on a new chunk of code pen. And that was like, I don't know. I don't know if it was a, a bad idea because it ended up in growth for us and more users and more paying users and stuff. But it kind of split our code base in an awkward way that required more maintenance and stuff. So, you know, paying that, that down took time as well. I mostly think of mistakes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do you do you have any other advice to people uh, trying to create a really cool product or uh, solo coders starting from zero or yeah, uh, maybe, you know, things you'd focus on today if you were kind of starting from scratch? Yeah, well, there's a lot, but you know, one of it needs to be, I think the word passion is a little overused, but I think somewhere in that line of thinking is important. Like, am I doing this because I actually like it? You know, like, uh, but, but you, you know, you do have to like it. I just love it. I feel like I'm pretty nerdy and I just like computer stuff and I like I, you know, it's not like I wake up in the room and I'm like, oh, I have to work on this product now. Like I get to work on that product. I feel like if you can somehow, some way get yourself into that position where you're working something because you like doing it, that you're just, that's going to, that's going to end well for you because you're, I think it widens the other side. It, you're like, okay with whatever happens because you're like, my life's pretty cool. I get to, I don't hate what I do. If I get, to, if I get to do that till I'm old, maybe that's okay. If I'm lost people. People yeah. love it. That's great. If some people love it, that's great too. And and what do you think about content creation? I, I kind of already know your answer, but for like the programming space, do you think that's like, you know, a viable thing for people to do to maybe discover some of these problems, find an audience? But it is design? kind of a, in, a, in a way it's a cheat code, a little bit like design is a cheat code, you know, like an open source library that has this beautifully designed landing page. It's just going to do better than mm -hmm. one that even if it's better tech, if it has this ugly, crappy landing page. So design is a cheat code in that way. So is content content in a way like if you're producing it and people are connecting with it it has the seo value and stuff in a way it's 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 part of the recipe for success you know and, you know docs are another one and outreach is another one and there's different kinds of social media and press in the flesh and all that kind of i'm sure there's been a hundred nerds who have written a better version of sql you know and they want to show it to you and they're like look i made it it's a ball <laughs> SQL's dumb. You need to use Peter SQL. It's I've solved all the problems. And you're like, nobody cares, man. Nobody cares <laughs> until 
until it has all these other elements of usage, you know, like you can't just do just the tech part. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Yeah. And you're probably the, you know, best person to say it. So if you're saying it, like, don't listen to me, listen to listen to Chris. So yeah, anyway, so I think that was great and awesome. So I, I can let you go. Okay. But I, I think we got some really good stuff from this uh, conversation. Wonderful. I, I hope it's all been useful. And I look forward to seeing whatever the heck you do with it. Do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool.